This year, both candidates for president made a hard play for the affections and votes of Christians, especially conservative, evangelical, and Catholic voters. Vice President Biden's campaign expected his lifelong identity as a practicing Catholic would allow him to compete for millions of voters separated from the party of their parents and grandparents because of issues like abortion. But President Trump's connection to Christian voters was inseverable. No personal revelation, off-color remark, or tweet would be enough to break a relationship built on the wall promises he kept to Christian voters. But why? Today on State of Independence, we'll talk to a well-known Christian journalist who's concerned the courting of power, specifically political power, may be dimming the Christian witness to a watching world. You won't want to miss this conversation. Stay with us. At World Magazine, a publication known for serious journalism and a hold-no-punches reputation for reporting news through the lens of a Christian worldview, Warren Cole Smith's podcast, Listening In, goes in-depth with well-known pastors, musicians, and ministry leaders to introduce his audience to the real, more approachable person behind the persona. In fact, if there's a theme in his work, it's that Smith isn't a fan of the modern self-promoting Christian celebrity or the money-making mega-ministries that fund the lavish lifestyles of their ministry leaders and their families. But he's concerned about something else, too, the courtship and marriage of politicians of well-known Christian charities, ministries, colleges, and churches. No, not the participation of Christians in politics, but Christianity being so closely identified with politicians. So where should Christians draw the line? How far is too far? We'll go to the president of Ministry Watch, Warren Colesmith, for answers. But first, watch this. The quest for political power is a game. The winner controls the direction of towns, states, even countries. In America, access to the levers of power means control of courts, Congress, state legislatures. And the biggest prize, the White House. But how should Christians treat the game? What are the rules of engagement as consultants, candidates, voters, and kingmakers? What happens when the goals of two kingdoms come in conflict? Is it possible to win elections but lose your soul? A Christian journalist offers an answer. Power plays. Christians in politics. Warren Cole Smith, thank you so much for joining us. We're delighted to have you. And uh, you're one of the leading observers uh, of, of uh, the relationship between uh, Christians and uh, in America and politics. And, and let's, let's be honest, I mean, Republicans and Democrats have benefited from it. Uh, Jimmy Carter was the first uh, politician running for president to say that he was born again. Uh, both uh, uh, President uh, 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 Reagan and Bill Clinton and, 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 and Barack Obama uh, identified as, as Christians. Um, and President Bush, of course, both President Bushes claimed to be Christians and, and, and strong believers in Christ. If you were to step back, if you were to step back for a second um, and describe the state of the relationship between Christians and the White House now, uh, some see this as a golden moment for that relationship, the fact that you know, Christians have a great relationship right now with the White House. Uh, others take a more cautious view. What do you think? Well, I would be one of those that would take a more cautious view. In fact, I would say even a much more cautious view. I think it's a very troubled relationship right now. I, I think that uh, that in that many Christian leaders, um, because they love the access, because they love the money that can be raised uh, whenever they get their picture taken with the president and they can put that picture in their fundraising campaigns, um, have become in some ways uh, addicted uh, to that money, power, and access, and they've been willing to say and do things uh, that um, uh, at a minimum don't support the gospel, and at a maximum, you could say in some ways, undermine the gospel. Well, this, this, you, you raise a, a, a number of really good points. I mean, um, you know, some would argue that by supporting politicians who uh, support the issues, issues that, that 
Christian people care about and religious freedom that, you know, that's a good thing for, for, for Christian people to have somebody, uh, uh, to have a relationship uh, clearly in the White House uh, of, 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 a, of, of a person who believes what we believe, who certainly believes in supporting the need for us to have uh, religious freedom. Um, and, and, then, and then some people say maybe politics asks too much of Christians. I, I don't know. What, what do you think about that? Do you think that well, yeah, I think I think politics is asking too much of evangelical leaders. The problem is that evangelical and, and I don't blame politics for that. That's what politics does. Politics is in the business of trying to, you know, to uh, consolidate power. What I blame, I would blame the evangelical leaders for succumbing uh, to that seduction. Uh, that, um, you know, Joe, uh, you're, the name of your program is State of Independence. And I believe that that's a, that's a, that's a noble, honorable, and proper posture uh, to be independent. Um, I think we should praise President Trump or any other president whenever uh, he or she does things that Christians can and should support. But we need to maintain enough independence to be able to criticize any leader in office who is doing things that are contrary to the gospel uh, or who is failing to live up to the promises that uh, he made to us. Uh, you know, the Bible says, render unto God um, what is God's and render unto Caesar what is Caesar. So I have no problem uh, with, with Christians being involved in politics, uh, but we shouldn't over render to Caesar those allegiances that properly belong to God. Well, uh, you raise uh, all the, the the great points. I think that uh, Christians certainly should consider. I mean, at the end of the day, what's expected of us? I mean, we've got people watching uh, uh, who self-identify. Many of them self-identify as Christian people, and and, and the the question for for a lot of us is. What does God expect of us? You know, in this, is this a bargain? Is this a bargain with the devil, uh, or or are, are we to be discerning, or are we to call out uh, uh, even people in power who support us uh, if they say things that with which we don't agree, uh, or, or are we to 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 kind of turn a blind eye to uh, weakness because we all realize that we all fall short of God's glory, that we're all sinners. I mean, what's, what's expected of us in, in this? And is this a bargain with the devil? Or, or t tell me what your, your sense of that is. Well, Joe, I think, I mean, you raise a lot of questions. And I think if you look at them, um, you know, those questions, maybe in just the way you've put them, they might almost sound like binary choices. We've got, either got to do this or we've got to do that. And uh, I would argue that as Christians, we've got to learn to walk and chew gum at the same time, especially as we enter the public square and the political arena. So, yes, we should support uh, the president or any political leader when he or she does things that, um, that we support, that are consistent with biblical values, that protect life, that protect religious liberty, uh, that protect uh, you know, the sanctity of marriage. But we've also, again, got to maintain our independence and be willing and able to criticize uh, the um, you know those same those same political leaders. We can't be we can't be seen as being so much in their camp that we have to agree with them on everything that they do. And if I could just make one quick point, um, you know the Bible um, actually gives us some pretty good guidance about. Um, uh, how we are to behave in the public square. Uh, and that is in the first and second commandment. They asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And they, and he said to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He was just quoting the Old Testament, by the way, whenever he said that. And he said the second commandment is like the first, love your neighbor as yourself. So I think that that while to a lot of listeners that might sound trite or cliche, I don't think that either of those commandments coming directly from the mouth of Jesus as the two greatest commandments are trite and cliche. I think they're deeply profound and they should be guiding our thinking and actions as Christians when we enter the public square, including the political arena. Right. So is the pursuit of political power for, for people of faith, I mean, how do you draw the line there as well? I mean, somebody's a Christian person, they run for office, uh, they, they want to be elected, they have they want to do good things for the people that, uh, that they would represent, uh, and, and then they, they get there, and, and then there are all the challenges that come with being in office. You, you have to make deals, of course, to get things done. You may have to compromise here, compromise there. Uh, you know, 
how, tell me about discernment uh, for, uh, for elected people, uh, pe- for people who seek to serve God by serving their neighbors uh, in, the, in the House or in the Senate uh, or as governor or in any other position or as president of the United States. Uh, t- tell me about the kind of discernment they need because it's so hard to, to not be overtaken by um, by all the people coming at you and by the adulation of the crowd, you know, the cheers of the crowd, uh, or even uh, the, when, when the criticism of the crowd. You know, when you get heavily criticized by folks, you know, there's, a, I think, a natural tendency for politicians to want to fix this and make it right and, 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 and figure out what they need to do to, to get back in good with the people that elected them. Can you talk to some of that? Well, I think so. But you've raised a whole bunch of uh, really interesting points. So let me try to crystallize it in a couple. Uh, first of all, you're right. I, it's, it's very tempting when you are in the public eye to retreat from those who criticize you uh, towards those who are going to affirm you. And, uh, you know, I get that. I have felt that tendency myself as a ministry leader that when people criticize what I do, I just want to kind of shut those folks out and, and you know, bask in the glow of those who are saying good things about me. So I think one of the things that we have to do, any of us who are in the public eye, even in a small way, like maybe Joe, you and I are, but certainly if we're in a in a political um, uh, arena is that we've got to have at least a few people around us you know, who are willing to tell us the truth, who are willing to say, you know, when we're making a mistake or that, that they are not so in love with their own access to political power that they won't tell us the truth. The other thing that I would say, too, is that there's uh, a difference, I think, uh, I don't think compromise is a bad word whenever it comes to certain policy issues. But I think that if you're going to be in the public square, if you are going to be a politician, elected office, you should know what your core principles are and you should not compromise those core principles. Joe, if you and I get into a disagreement about whether the tariff on goods to China should be 14% or 15%, I've got no problem with, you know, maybe having a compromise there. Maybe we can compromise at 14.5%. But when it comes to issues of life, abortion, for example, when it comes to issues of religious liberty, I think Christians that are going to be involved in the public square, especially in elected office, should know what their core principles are, should know what represents a compromise of those core principles, and stay away from those kinds of compromises of principle. When it comes to certain policy issues, I I think that, uh, you know, Christians can and should exercise influence uh, in those arenas. So tell me what you think as well about the, the line. Uh, for a lot of people who consider running for office, uh, the big challenge becomes, how do I make the distinction between my personal ambition uh, to be somebody and to get somewhere and what God wants for me? Uh, you know, because God, clearly there are people who are where God put them, uh, but there's also the issue of, of personal ambition. You know, I mean, who doesn't want to see their name in lights? Who doesn't want to see, doesn't want to be seated, sit at the honored place, you know, uh, at the political table? Who doesn't want to uh, have uh, people uh, talking about them every day and about their every move? I mean, it, it, it's, uh, so we're, how, how do, if, if a Christian person is thinking about running for office, how do they make that distinction? How, do they, how are they able to discern the difference between personal ambition, uh, because I want to get there, I want this for me, I want to see my name in lights, and what, God, what, what it is that God would have for them? Well, I think a part of the answer to that question comes from just your own spiritual maturity. Are you ready for the public um, uh, spotlight? And uh, to, for me, a, a, a guiding principle is uh, what, uh, what is your first love? Uh, obviously, Joe, you, you know, you, you're right. Ambition has, you know, probably plays a, a part in people uh, running for office, um, you know, wanting, wanting to have influence and power. And I'm not saying that those things are necessarily bad, but I think that they make terrible first principles. I think they make uh, terrible first loves, if you will. And I think that our first love as Christians, when we enter the public square, should be first loving God. Uh, is this a way that I can love God, that I can bring glory to God by manifesting the gifts and the vocation that he has given to me? Is this the arena that he has called me to? 
And secondly, am I serving others? Uh, is this a way that I'm loving my neighbor? Am I serving them in ways that uh, I couldn't serve them in other arenas or spheres of life? And I think that if you can answer yes to those two questions, that this is a powerful way that I can love God and bring glory to God by manifesting my gifts and my vocation. And number two, it's a great way for me uh, to serve others. I think if those are your first two motivations, if you can answer yes to those questions, then uh, you should consider public service. But if not, then maybe not. <laughs> Well, last last question before we go to the break, uh, and, and I know you've been one of the faces of the Colson Center. Charles Colson, of course, was uh, an aide to President Richard Nixon, uh, famous, made famous by, the, by, by the, 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 the tragedy of Watergate, of course, and he spent time in prison, but, be, but famously became a Christian while in prison uh, and, and it changed his life and ended up changing the lives of many others who heard the gospel through him. Let me, let me read you something that he wrote. Um, about political power. When the church aligns itself politically, it gives priority to the compromises and temporal successes of the political world rather than its Christian confession of eternal truth. And when the church gives up its rightful place as the conscience of the culture, the consequences for society can be horrific. Is this still true? Um, or is it possible that things have gotten better in Washington because of well-placed allies in high office? Well, I think it's absolutely still true. That's one of the things that make Chuck, Chuck Colson a great man is that a lot of what he said resonates through the years. It's absolutely still true. I don't think that things have gotten better in Washington. In fact, I would say over the years that in some ways it's gotten worse just because the federal government has gotten larger. The temptations for power are much so much greater even today than even they were when Chuck Colson was working next to Richard Nixon in the White House. So I think that that's one of the reasons why we must be doubly guarded as even evangelicals about uh, whether and how we give our allegiance to people in office. I think that, that we are called to speak truth to power. We are called to put the gospel first. And if we can use uh, political influence as a, as a tool for doing that, uh, I see no problem with it. But whenever it becomes the end in and of itself, when we have to compromise the gospel in order to achieve political power, and I think that's what many evangelicals have done today. Let me just be clear about that. I think that's a big problem. Well, it takes courage, doesn't it, brother? It takes courage to stand strong and to put your faith first, uh, even ahead of the, the, the applause of the crowd um, and, the, and the, the, the admiration of people. Uh, it takes tremendous courage to do that. Um, uh, and it, it, it's not just the political arena that we want to talk about uh, where Christians need to have discernment. Uh, when we come back, I want to ask Warren about his new book, Faith-Based Fraud, Learning from the Great Religious Scandals of Our Time. Stay with us. Learn more about Joe Watkins and the mission of this program at joewatkins.net. And tell Joe what you thought about today's program in the comment box. My guest is Warren Cole Smith, and I wanted to shift topics for the few minutes we have left to his new book, Faith-Based Fraud. What a, a great title. You know, th these are, are strange times for Christians in media, as we know. Um, clearly, um, th there's a lot of money to be made in, 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 in Christian media for, for some people. Um, I'm, I'm part of this wonderful ministry here at Lighthouse TV, which is not at all about money. It's about sharing the good news of the gospel with, 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 with anybody that, that might want to hear it, and, and maybe some people aren't expecting to hear it, and which is wonderful. And, uh, and this is not at all about health and wealth and prosperity. It, it's, it's really about the gospel of Jesus Christ and sharing it with folks, which I love. Um, but uh, uh, I'd like to hear from you about uh, what you think about some of the, uh, some of the mega uh, uh, personalities that have been, been created in the uh, in the last uh, few years by 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 media and by Christian media and by some of the mega ministries that are out there. I'm not condemning them all. I'm not saying that every mega ministry is a bad ministry or that you know mega pastors are all bad people and in it for the money. That's not true. I have friends who are church pastored large churches, but I, I sure would like you to speak to uh, you know what that reputation is doing to the cause of the gospel in the here in in, in this country. Well, it's a great question, Joe. And let me also disagree with you. I'm not condemning them all either. There are about a million Christian ministries in this country, about 300,000 churches in this country. And the vast majority of them, 99.5% probably, are, are living and behaving faithfully 
Um, their leaders are, uh, are uh, living sacrificially, not making a lot of money. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I want to make sure that, you know, whenever we say what we say about the bad guys, that we don't forget the overwhelming majority who are the good guys. But I will say that partly because of media, partly because of the seduction of political power that we've talked about in the first segment, that there are some um, ch church leaders, evangelical leaders and ministry leaders that are um, yielding to that. Um, that seduction. And they're growing large. They're forgetting their first love. Uh, the, the, the book Faith-Based Fraud sort of identifies uh, some of those people. And, and you know, I've, I've, I've named names in the book. Uh, you know, we tell the stories, for example, of, of Mark Driscoll in Morris Hill Church and uh, Bill Hybels in Willow Creek Community Church in the Chicago area. Uh, so, you know, there it there. And, but we don't tell these stories just to shame them or to, you know, kind of do what you might call gossip. Uh, what we're trying to do is to draw lessons from them, learn from them so that that doesn't happen to us. And one of the lessons that we learned is that transparency and accountability really do matter. If you are involved in ministry, you need to have uh, folks in your life that will speak the truth. And you need to conduct yourself in ways that are transparent uh, to the donors, to the board, and to other members in your life who um, can provide some accountability for you. So those are uh, two really important lessons well, seduction uh, that is we the, try to draw. Seduction becomes a, a big word because uh, you know, that, that's the challenge. I, I think there are loads of, of, of people who started out with a good heart and with, a, with, and with the right thought, which is, I just want to serve the Lord and, and whosoever will let them come. And, and then what ended up happening was is lots of people came because they were hungry for the gospel and, and suddenly they ended up with a much larger audience than they expected. And, and one of the consequences of that larger audience is lots of money. And, 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 and then that's where the seduction comes in is you don't, then you have a large audience, you don't want to lose that audience. And, and then you have to maintain what you have and, and you have all this money and, and you want to maintain it. And then your lifestyle improves and you want to maintain your lifestyle. And, and suddenly you're, 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 you're doing stuff that isn't so godly, uh, that doesn't look so great from the standpoint of the gospel. Uh, you know, uh, suddenly you're not centered on first loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and loving your neighbors yourself. You're, 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 you're consumed with how do we keep this going? How do we continue to bring in the dollars, bring in the money? And, and my fear also ends up being not only for, for and sadness for those people who, who were seduced and now can't get out of the seduction, uh, but also for, 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 for the members and for people. How do people discern between what is true and what is fake? You know, uh, how, how do people, we've got tons of people watching today who belong to a church somewhere or who are thinking about joining a church. How do they discern between what is what is true and what is not true? Yeah, great question. And I think you've said it exactly right. Nobody starts off wanting to defraud people or wanting to, uh, you know, do bad things, but they end up uh, there often or sometimes. And and I think it's because they have lost their first love. And as they get bigger, they don't have infrastructure around them. They don't have structures of accountability. So specifically to answer your question, Joe, I would encourage church members to ask, is there an independent board of elders or deacons that has ultimate responsibility for the church? Um, if you just put one man the pastor in charge, and he's not responsible to anyone, which happens a lot in independent churches these days, that's a problem. Number two are the financial statements being released at least to the membership of that church. I would say that for non-churches, for Christian ministries at large, um, they should be filing Form 990s. They shouldn't hide behind that church exemption. They should be forming for, um, they should be uh, filing Form 990s. If you're a donor, you should ask for those financial statements before you give to the church. Uh, by the way, if you go to ministrywatch.com, we have the financial statements, transparency grades, and efficiency, financial efficiency ratings of the 725 largest Christian ministries in the country at ministrywatch.com. And our listeners and viewers can check it out there if they're curious about a particular ministry. Yeah, you are the best. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Brother Warren Cole Smith. We have really appreciated this time with you and uh, pray that God will continue to bless you in your work. And everybody ought to get, go out and get your book. It, it'll just help you with the, to be able to discern. So God bless you, brother. And may uh, you, heaven smile on you. Take care. You're great. Good to be with you. We'll be right back. Share what you've learned on today's program by first connecting with Joe directly on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. 
Get started at joewatkins.net. What a blessing to talk to Warren Cole Smith. Now we're going to talk with our great producer, Jeff Coleman. Well, it felt like, Joe, that I was sitting in a private lunch between you and, uh, and Warren Cole Smith because, I mean, it was really interesting. Um, what struck me was this conversation that we often don't have, which is ambition. People generally look at ambition and they say it's a good thing that you're motivated, you get up, you have a goal in life. We tell our kids, you know, make big goals, make them audacious, and then and then gain your dreams. It's the American dream. Yeah, yeah. But you asked a question I thought that was interesting about uh, people who are motivated by their ambition to go into ministry or to go into politics as a yeah, ministry. Yeah. And what are the guardrails that you need to put in place against those seductions of power? And you said something interesting that says, if it works and it grows, how do you guard your heart against yeah. getting off mission? Yeah. And the answer, as he says, is love God love your neighbor as yourself, and make your ambition to know one person, yeah. God. Yeah. That's radical. It, it really gets is. so hard when, when lots of people get involved and there's money involved. Yeah, money's and a trick. Money yeah. it really is. Uh, it becomes very tricky because yeah. you know, money ends up guiding you know, what you can do, what you will do, Correct. the direction in which you'll head, as opposed to going where God leads you. Right. And, and that's the hard part. You know, what if God leads you to, to, to leave office? Right. What if God leads you to downsize your ministry? What if God says, I know you can't see tomorrow, but just head this way because right. this is what I want for you. Right. And just walk by faith. I mean. That's right. Well, we have this idea, I think, I, I, at least I do, that you do something in life and then you graduate to the next big thing. You, and the small thing that you did, raising a family, you know, doing all the, going to church, all the, you know, that won you the right to be a big thing, a big person. But it, it, I think what I'm really coming to believe and know uh, is that that's not, that's not God. Yeah. Uh, there are no little people and big people. There are really just people being faithful to do what they're supposed to do. So we're running into people every day who are extraordinary at the gas station, in the checkout line, in traffic next to us. Uh, they're incredible, made in the image of God. And we're not better bigger, smaller than them. That's, that's what changes, I think. Yeah, God doesn't life. care about size, but numbers. You know, I, he taught me that lesson because uh, I, I pastor a small church and, and you know what? That's where God put me. It's wonderful. Uh, yeah. God is so good. We'll so, keep reminding each other. We will. We All right. Will. <laughs> well, well, thank you for joining me on State of Independence. Our program is designed to encourage you, to give you hope, to remind you to stay on the path by trusting God with your whole heart and mind and soul and loving your neighbor as you love yourself. Special thanks to Warren Cole Smith for his courage and clarity in these uncertain times. Follow him on Twitter and Facebook to see how he's engaging the culture with grace. Connect with me at joewatkins.net. I see every email, I'd love to hear from you. God bless you and thanks for watching. Yeah, like the, the, uh, the tips that he gave on how to check a financial report of a church before you start writing a check. You don't think to do that often. You kind of write the check and get disappointed later. Joe Watkins' State of Independence is a production of Lighthouse TV, positively different. Made possible in part because of the support of viewers like you.